Hi, I'm Alan Smith at Pizzini's Market on the Central Coast in California, where beautiful produce abounds. You know, over the years, I've shared a lot of gardening advice and design tips with you. And from time to time, I've offered some of my favorite recipes, all inspired by the garden. I've been amazed by the response from you, the viewer. So I thought over the next half hour, we might take a look at some of the tastiest recipes from each season. We'll start with fall, where we'll enjoy autumn's bounty, including cream of roasted garlic potato soup and a time-saving mushroom saute. And then it's on to spring, which brings us to flowers. I'll show you how to sugar glaze edible flowers, and I'll let you in on the secret of my can't-miss artichoke dip. Summer is the perfect time to enjoy sorbet. I'll show you how to whip up this delicious treat and we'll make a pizza using one of my favorite summer berries. And finally, we'll warm up to winter as we enjoy a special tomato soup, rosemary cookies, and much, much more in this feast for the eyes, so don't go away. Over the years, I've visited lots of kitchens across the country and tasted many a fine dish. But you know, during the fall, one that comes to mind is a recipe for cream of roasted garlic potato soup prepared by Tony Baker at Montrio's Restaurant in Monterey, California. Uh, start with our, our ingredients here. We have some uh, beautiful um, Firm, a large cloves of fresh garlic. Right. We also have what we call mirepoix. We have some uh, fresh diced russet potatoes. We have some chopped thyme, some chopped parsley. And in our garnish here, we have some little, uh, uh, this is some bread that we make here and uh, that we pound out and, uh, and, and cook, cut into triangles. And we're going to use these for our Roquefort blue cheese croutons. This is Roquefort blue cheese, comes from the Roquefort region of France. Beautiful. Now, what are you going to start with? I'm going to start using the, uh, the garlic. We're going to roast these uh, whole cloves of garlic in the pan with some extra virgin olive oil. OK, we got our garlic. It's uh, nicely golden. We're bringing out that nice garlic roasted flavor. At this point, we're going to add our mirepoix vegetables. In this case, we're using a white mirepoix, which just means it doesn't have carrots. And it's going to be onions, leeks, and celery. We're using about one stick of celery, about half a white onion, and about one medium-sized leek. Okay, at this point, our vegetables are uh, sautéing pretty fast speed. They don't take long. They're cut very small. I'm going to add the potatoes. Again, russet potatoes. We've got about three medium-sized russet potatoes that are peeled and cut into a small dice. This is what gives the soup the body, thickens the soup. So I'm going to add the thyme at this point, which is a pretty robust and hearty herb, which uh, needs to be cooked out. You know, it's not one of those delicate herbs like basil or dill which should be added at the end of a dish. Um, well, you're generous with it. Oh, absolutely. Fresh thyme is not like dried herb. Dried herbs, uh, you can use about four or five times less than you would of a fresh herb. But the stock, we're going to at least cover the vegetables with the stock, which is going to be about two pints. I'm going to turn the heat up on that and bring it up to a boil. When it reaches a boil, we're going to turn it down to a simmer and cook that for about 20 to 25 minutes until all the ingredients are soft. So now you're going to blend all this together? Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm using my big old bazooka here. <laughs> I sure are. We're not... I don't have one of these. <laughs> so what can I use? Well, they do a very, uh, they do a domestic version of this, a real nice little uh, small white thing that you can buy in the right. store. Or I'm sure most people have a regular blender or sure. food processor. Right. Uh, any of those things will work just as well. We're going to blend all uh, the ingredients together. Absolutely. Well, so let let it Okay, so we're going to uh, serve the soup now. It's just a beautiful consistency, nice and thick, rich, creamy. Serve it in a nice large bowl. 
size of this ball looks daunting, but really the quantity of soup in it is no, uh, not much more than a good sized coffee cup. Right. Okay, we're gonna take our croutons, position it over the top. Artistically placed. A little chopped parsley. Uh-huh, and there's where the parsley comes in. Beautiful. And bam, roasted garlic, potato soup with a raw pork cheese crouton. Ready to, ready to serve. Bravo, Tony, it looks delicious. And if you think that's something, take a look at this. The folks in Gilroy, California are so crazy about garlic that they celebrate this herb yearly with the Garlic Festival. Who knew that food could be this much fun? Another great recipe that uses garlic is one for mushroom saute. It only takes a few minutes to prepare, which means you have more time to enjoy your favorite pastime. Start with about 10 to 12 medium-sized caps. To prepare the saute, just melt about two tablespoons of butter in a large saucepan, and then add a couple of tablespoons of chopped onions and a clove or two of crushed garlic. Stir over medium heat until the onions are transparent. Now I'm ready for the mushrooms. I've rinsed them, and I'll add them whole to the saute, along with about a teaspoon of soy sauce. Then I'll cover them for about two minutes until they're wilted. At this stage, the aroma is unbelievable. Now just remember, these will cook in no time, so be careful not to overcook them. For this recipe and many more, log on to my website. That's pallensmith.com. If your taste buds aren't watering yet, they will be. Later in the show, some of my favorite recipes for summer and winter, including this strawberry pizza and a sumptuous soup. But coming up next, I'll show you how to use the flowers from your spring garden to spruce up a dessert. Don't go away. Ask any gardener what they enjoy the most about the spring, and they'll almost always tell you it's the beautiful flowers and the garden fresh vegetables. I'd say I'd have to agree, because I'm always looking for ways to combine these two elements in my garden. I think that vegetables can be as attractive as flowers. Just take a look at this butter crunch lettuce. Now while flowers may seem like an unlikely candidate for the vegetable garden, they do add their own touch or flavor, and I mean quite literally. These little violas don't taste too bad. Now not everyone has this much space to grow vegetables and flowers together, but you can create the same effect by using edibles as ornamentals in a container. Let me show you. Last fall I planted about 20 tulip bulbs in this container. Once they started to emerge in the early spring, I planted some parsley and two types of lettuce. I really like the combination of colors and textures this creates. Of course, not every combination is edible. I certainly wouldn't eat these tulips. Now let's go into the kitchen where I'll show you how to use some of these edible flowers to add sparkle to any event. Visit virtually any restaurant these days across the country, and you'll find that chefs are using flowers not only as a garnish for food, but as an ingredient as well. Now this isn't a new idea. In the 19th century, bakers used flowers in a crystallized form to decorate confections, just as I've done here with this cake. Not only are these crystallized flowers beautiful to look at, but they're delicious to eat and it's a great way to use certain flowers from your own garden. Of course, you wouldn't want to eat every bloom. Some taste better than others, but there is quite a range of edible flowers. There are roses, scented geraniums, snapdragons, and a whole host of herbs. If you try using flowers this way, I can't think of a better reason to avoid using pesticides. Now today, I'm using violets, some violas, and mint leaves to decorate this cake. Let me show you the process, it's very simple. First, I created a syrup by taking a full cup of granulated sugar and a half a cup of water. I put this on medium heat and brought it to a boil and let it simmer for two to three minutes until the syrup ran clear. 
After I allowed the syrup to cool, I applied it to the leaves and flowers and then sprinkled granulated sugar on them. After they've dried a bit, I simply apply them to the cake. If you'd like more information on edible flowers, just check out our website. That's pallensmith.com. In the past, I've spent hours going through recipes, looking for that perfect appetizer or snack. And you know, I always seem to fall back on the same old recipe, one a friend gave me years ago and it's become one of my favorites. This is simple, easy to put together and doesn't take much time at all. The only problem with it is that it tastes so good I often eat all of it before my guests arrive. This recipe is centered around the bud of a flower of a plant that we all know, the artichoke. Now of course the artichoke isn't something that we commonly grow in our flower beds at home, but we can certainly enjoy its delicious flavor. Virtually all of the artichokes grown in this country come from California's central coast, and the fields of them growing are a sight to see. Even though fresh artichokes are hard to beat, canned ones are readily available in the grocery store, and I think they're actually better for this recipe. To put this together, just mix two cans of drained artichoke hearts quartered with one cup of mayonnaise and one cup of freshly shredded Parmesan or Romano cheese. Bake at 350 for 20 minutes. Now the aroma of this dip is outstanding. It's always amazing to me how three basic ingredients can come together to make such a delicious treat. Now it's best served warm, in my opinion, with your favorite cracker. Now the next time you have guests coming over, whether they're friends or relatives, you might try this simple recipe. It'll save you some time in the kitchen. I hope you're saving room for dessert, because coming up next, we're going to sample the best summer has to offer with some sweet treats. There are so many wonderful things about summer. Besides time off from school for the kids and summer vacations, there's the garden full of abundance in the way of fruits and vegetables. In today's show, we're taking a look at some of my all-time favorite recipes. Earlier, we sampled the savory flavors of autumn and the light, refreshing taste of spring. If you missed any of these recipes, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. They're all posted there along with many tips you can apply to your own garden. Eating strawberries has always been a treat for me. I can remember picking them with my grandmother Smith when I was a kid in what seemed like a huge patch at the time. I suppose I'll always have a passion for this delicious little fruit. I can't think of a recipe using them that I don't like. This one I'm putting together today is one of my favorites. It's strawberry pizza, and you'll find that kids of all ages will love it. The crust is made of just three simple ingredients. I use two cups of flour with one cup of butter and about a half a cup of powdered sugar. Now just blend all of these together and press the dough into the bottom of a nine inch pie pan. Now don't worry about greasing the pan. Now you want to do this until it's evenly distributed. Just bake it at 375 until golden brown. The nice thing about this recipe is that it calls for enough ingredients to make two pizzas. And once you've tasted it, you'll be glad you made two. Now for the filling, I use 16 ounces of cream cheese. You can use the light, it tastes just as good as far as I'm concerned, and one cup of sugar. Now, you blend all of this together. And once the pie crusts have cooled, you spread it on them. Now for the finale. Sweeten about two and a half cups of berries with a couple of tablespoons of sugar, and add two tablespoons of cornstarch, and bring all of this to a simmer. When the mixture's thickened, remove it from the heat and let it cool, and then spread this over the cream cheese filling. This follows the recipe, but I've also used fresh sliced berries on the cream cheese. Now I'll chill it and it'll be ready in about an hour. Keeping with this sweet theme, there's really nothing more refreshing in the hot summer than the taste of cool mint sorbet. There are so many mints you can use for this, but the one I prefer is one I grow in my own garden. It's the mild flavored spearmint. Sorbets of any kind are a light, low-cal, no-fat treat. This one is really simple to put together. It only takes a few ingredients. 
First, I stripped and washed enough leaves to make one packed cup of spearmint. Then I prepared a solution of three cups water, two thirds cup of corn syrup, and the same amount of sugar. I brought the mixture to a boil, then added the mint. I covered the pot and removed it from the burner and let it set for about 15 minutes. After the mint has flavored the solution, I strain it and add the juice of two fresh squeezed lemons. Then I chill or partially freeze the liquid and fold in two beaten egg whites. You just freeze this like ice cream and this sorbet is delicious. Ask anyone who grows herbs and they'll tell you that mint is one of the easiest to grow. You can grow it in containers or even in the shade. But be forewarned, mint can be a vigorous grower. Here's one way I deal with keeping mint from spreading. Rather than planting the mint directly into your beds, cut the bottom out of a large plastic nursery container and bury it into the soil. Then plant the mint within the container. This will keep it from spreading and taking over, at least for a while. Now don't go away, we'll sample the flavors of winter coming up next. When the temperature drops and the days become shorter, few things taste as good to me as hot homemade soup, particularly when I've been working outside. A few years ago, a friend gave me the recipe from a famous French restaurant for a robust tomato soup, and it's the best I've ever had. It starts with fresh tomatoes, if you can find some with good flavor. Just peel and dice enough to make four cups. If you don't have fresh, you may use canned. Pour the tomatoes into a large saucepan along with four cups of tomato juice and let this simmer for about 30 minutes. Now for a little flavor boost. One of my favorite herbs to use with tomatoes is basil, so it just makes good sense to use it in tomato soup. Now one of the easiest ways I've found to preserve or store basil is to chop it and freeze it in ice trays in the form of little cubes like this. I just drop them into the cooked tomatoes and let them melt. Then I pour the tomatoes and basil into a blender and blend them until they're smooth. Then I return the mixture to the pan and add one stick of unsalted butter, one cup of whipping cream, and about a fourth of a teaspoon of cracked pepper and salt to taste. Now I'll just heat this through and it'll be ready in a few minutes. With the cream and butter, it's certainly not low cal, but hey, we've got to live a little. I really don't do much baking, but there are certain recipes that have become favorites of mine over the years, and they can always lure me back into the kitchen. One of these is for a simple cookie, and it includes one of my favorite herbs, rosemary. It all begins with a basic sugar or butter cookie recipe of your choice. I just blend together a half a cup of butter with a half a cup of shortening, a cup and a half of sugar, and two eggs. Now that this is nice and creamy, I'm ready to stir in the dry ingredients, which include two and three quarter cups of flour, two teaspoons of cream of tartar, one teaspoon of soda, and about a fourth a teaspoon of salt, all blended together. Be sure to sift your flour before you add it. Now I'm ready for the most important ingredient, at least when it comes to flavor. I'm using two scant teaspoons of fresh chopped rosemary. Now I'm forming the dough into small balls and placing them on an ungreased baking sheet. I like to press them with the bottom of a drinking glass that I've dipped in sugar. This gives them a nice crunchy glaze. Now I'm ready to slide them into a preheated 400 degree oven for only about eight minutes. This is a great way to enjoy both the flavor and aroma of rosemary. More people are allergic to the fragrance of roses than to the pollen that these beautiful flowers produce. Now, if you're worried about pollen from roses, you might keep in mind that fully double roses release less pollen than single flower varieties. One of my favorite low pollen roses is Iceberg. Well, that's it for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed this little venture from the garden to the kitchen as much as I have. For all the tips and recipes in today's show, you just log on to my website. That's pallensmith.com. In fact, I'm going to log on 
come up with something for supper tonight, and I hope you'll do the same. From the garden, I'm Alan Smith. This garden I dream of a bed of flowers Bluebirds sing of the beauty all around us And every time the sun comes out I can't help but smile oh, But smile 